that there is some kind of war on Islam. Uh, I don't believe this to be the case. But this is the view that is propagated in much of the Islamic work, that the Western world is against us. So the people in the Islamic world have this negative feeling about the West. And likewise, in the Western world, there is this feeling that maybe the rulers of some of the Islamic nations are cooperative. We can do business with them, we can talk with them, and we can get to know them, but we have to be very cautious about the people of the Islamic world because there is something about Islam itself which is negative, which is anti-freedom, which is anti-women, which is anti-peace. Now, as somebody who has lived amongst Muslims for a long time, who has studied the Islamic world to some extent, uh, I'm a Hindu, I'm of <coughs> Indian origin, I'm an Indian national, I'm a visiting professor here in the United States. Um, and I know uh, that while there are, of course, people who are angry and militant and often violent uh, in the Islamic world, that is not Islam. Nonetheless, today in much of the Western world, there is this view that there is something essentially flawed about Islam. And it's propagated on talk shows, radios, television, popular books, the media. Uh, so there is this enormous difference. Um, when, during the Cold War, there was this division between rulers and rulers, or you might say rulers and people on all sides against the rulers of the communist world. Today there is this rather serious divide uh, between the peoples of the so-called Islamic world on the one side and the Western world on the other. So that's one thing that I want us to remember. That's my portion number one. My portion number two is about Gandhi. And the two are related because Although Gandhi fought for the liberty of India from British imperialism, he also fought for the equality of the Indian people because the Indian society was, and to some extent today still is, deeply divided along lines of caste and class. And you've all heard of the caste system of India. You've heard of the uh, old and shameful practice of untouchability. Um, the so-called high caste and so-called middle caste, so-called low caste and the so-called untouchables. And that too was a uh, focus of Gandhi's life and battles uh, to unite Indians across caste and to end this horrible inequality. Fighting the British, fighting against caste inequality and fighting for Hindu-Muslim friendship. These were the three great goals of his life. In some ways, the Hindu-Muslim divide of India, which has been a divide existing for a long time, is today extended, expanded into the global divide between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. So Gandhi's work in that regard is perhaps of direct relevance to today's supposedly civilizational divide between the Islamic world and the, uh, the Western world. So, um, about Gandhi, and in particular his work on this Hindu-Muslim front. Um, Gandhi was 78 when he was killed in New Delhi in January of 1948. He was killed by some staunch, proud Hindus who felt that Gandhi was not himself as staunch a Hindu as he should have been. And how did they measure his staunchness in Hinduism? They measured it by his attitude towards the Muslims. If you were not sufficiently anti-Muslim, then you were not sufficiently Hindu. And they judged that Gandhi was friendlier to the Muslims than necessary, more forgiving of Muslims than was wise, and therefore they decided to kill him. This was on January 30th, 1948. At this time, I was a 12 and a half year old boy in New Delhi. Gandhi had four sons, he had no daughters, sadly. Uh, 
And my father, the youngest of the four sons, was an editor in New Delhi, editor of a newspaper called the Hindustan Times, an English language daily newspaper. I was going to school in New Delhi with my siblings. The last two years of Gandhi's life were spent not continuously, but a good deal in New Delhi. He was in and out of New Delhi a good deal of this last two years of his life. And the last five months of his life he spent in New Delhi. August 47, about six months, five months before he was killed, is when India became independent. But as some of you will know, India was also divided at the same time as it became independent, and two nations were created, India and Pakistan. And Pakistan was made out of the Muslim majority portions of India. So wherever the Muslims were in the majority, that portion became the new country called Pakistan, and the rest of India, which was larger in terms of both population and area, uh, remained as India, except that it was now independent. So, independence brought great joy. It was the fulfillment of Gandhi's life, you might say, at least of one great part of his life. It also brought great pain, because half a million people, at least, some people think maybe one million, some people say even one and a half million, were killed in two months in August and September of 1947, especially in one large area in the northern part of India called the Punjab, half of which was with Pakistan, it had a Muslim majority, the other half of which, the eastern part, remained in India, it had a Muslim minority. Um, and if we think that half a million were killed, if we accept that estimate, then it's also useful to note that roughly half of those killed were Hindus and Sikhs, and the other half of who those were killed were Muslims. So there was some kind of curious parity in the number of people killed, the Muslims killed and the non-Muslims killed. About five and a half to six million Muslims left eastern Punjab, went to western Punjab in Pakistan, and an equal number, about five and a half to six million Hindus and Sikhs left Western Punjab to, into Eastern Punjab. That was part of the story of 47. Great killings, abductions, rapes, great migrations and uprootings. 